and welcome to Design Systems Part 2. I'm now even a bigger deal on the internet than last time, so this is gonna be a good talk. So the first video, Design Systems Part 1, did really good. It wasn't really a part one, it was just a talk for Next.js.Conf. So I thought, hey, why not make a follow-up video that goes a little more in-depth on CVA, some more features of it, a little more in-depth on Tailwind, and even a little more in-depth on Storybook. Let's go deeper. So let's do a quick recap of CVA. So CVA is Class Variance Authority. It's a package that gives you an easy to use interface to define variants, which conditionally apply sets of classes. Let's take a look at where variants might come in handy. So here we have a button component that's written in our Next.js application. Here we have button styles, which is basically a function call of CVA. What does this do? Well, here we're defining styles that exist on every single button. That's this top row right here. This is written as a string, but you can also put all of these into an array with separate strings. And now in here is where we define variants on this button. So we're saying there's a variant intent and this intent can change. It can be primary, secondary, or danger. And we also have a variant for full width. So if full width is true, then it'll basically set the button to full width. Now underneath this, we have something called default variants. What this means is that Whenever you use a button and you don't define a intent on it, an intent? <laughs> when you don't define an intent on it, that means it'll default to primary. We can also default buttons to not be full width by also saying full width and false. Now let's take a look at compound variants. They come in handy when classes are applied based on a combination of variants. So here I have a variant outline. And when outline is true, it basically sets the background to be transparent of all the buttons and adds a border. This is probably not the best way that I would do this <laughs> in a design system. I might just have a different option for a bordered button versus a filled button. But for now, I did it this way. So let's just use this. Now to define compound variants, you use an array. And in this array are all the different variations that you'd want. So here I just have one. What this is saying is that when the intent is danger and there is an outline, apply these classes. So we apply border red 500 and text red 500. So if we go take a look at this button, this is when outline is false. And if I click true, this is what the button looks like when outline is true. The other really cool thing that CVA just added is you can target multiple variant options. So here, instead of just using string danger, I can actually set an array and say that even if it's, if it's danger or even if it's primary, then I wanna apply this. So now if we go take a look at storybook, when I set outline to true here, it sets those same classes. So it works for both primary and danger. Someone brought up a question on the last video, which was about responsive design. I wouldn't recommend using CVA to handle responsive design. A lot of that is handled within just Tailwind itself. So Tailwind handles responsive design for you. It doesn't actually do the work for you, but it gives you breakpoint prefixes. Similar to how CSS has media queries, breakpoints in Tailwind work about the same way. So here you can see that they have some preset ones. So SM is 640 pix minimum, MD is 768, et cetera, et cetera. So there's five breakpoints that they give by default. And once again, these can all be changed in the Tailwind config. Here you can even set different names. So there's tablet, laptop, desktop here. So whatever you wanna do, the Tailwind config file can do for you. So when you use the Tailwind breakpoint system, you wanna think mobile first. So write all your classes like you would for mobile screens. So the smallest screen possible. And then use the higher breakpoints to define what you'll do at the larger breakpoints. Tailwind also lets you set arbitrary breakpoints. So here you can set min and pass in a value in square brackets and then set whatever classes you want to on that value. So if you take a look at this example here, how this works is you set a default width. So this is width 16. And then you can set whatever breakpoint higher than that. So here there's a medium breakpoint. And when you hit the medium width, it will basically set W32. And then when you hit large, it'll set W48. I think this is a really good solution. There is this little bit of annoyance here where you basically have to use MD for each separate class that you kind of want to define. So here you have to set an MD prefix on hful and an MD prefix on W48 to have those both occur at the medium breakpoint. So it does end up getting really long, <laughs> but it's still a pretty good solution and it works pretty well. Someone also asked on the last video about dark mode. 
And so dark mode is also something that you would wanna handle using Tailwind. So similarly to how we had those breakpoint prefixes, there is a dark prefix that lets you apply classes differently based on when dark mode is active or not. So as you see here, this div is normally background white, but in dark mode, it is background slate 800. So to set up dark mode in your application, in your Tailwind config, you basically have to set dark mode to something. So in our app, I use class versus media. If you put media here, it will basically follow whatever the system has set to the theme. So if you set your Mac OS theme to be dark, it'll follow that. If you set to light, it'll follow that, etc. So, so I'm using class because sometimes users want to override whatever the system default is. So that's why I'm using class here. So when you set dark mode to class and tailwind, it basically checks whether or not this class dark is applied earlier on in your HTML tree. So what I use is this package next themes and I grab the theme provider from that. And so our theme provider here has a storage key that basically sets in your local storage the key for what your preferred theme is. <laughs> so let's say on your page you have a toggle and the user checks that toggle so that it goes to light mode, it will set basically the preferred theme key in your local storage to light and then swap back to dark based on the toggle state. And then now I'm using this attribute and I'm saying class. And now what this is basically saying is it will set HTML class equals dark whenever it is toggled to dark mode. So that's pretty much it. It's pretty simple. So yeah, this is the package. It's called next themes. So I would take a look at this if you want to know more but that's how I used it, pretty simple. So dark mode is really interesting. It's hard to test this in storybook because there's no real way, like my system right now is in dark mode, you can tell by the header, but the storybook is in light mode. So I found a very cool package <laughs> that lets you basically toggle Tailwind dark mode. So let's say we go to the secondary button. If I toggle dark mode on and off, you can see that the button text color is changing and the button background color is changing. So that little extension is called Tailwind Dark Mode or the package is Storybook Tailwind Dark Mode. And yeah, this is what I use. Super easy to install and it works great. And it worked immediately. I didn't have to do any setup. I basically ran this installation. JK, I actually had to do this. <laughs> in my main JS in my Storybook folder, I basically had to set that there is an add-on. So if you look here, I have the add-on right here. So this whole time I've been showing you the changes that we're making in our design system using Storybook. So let's talk a little bit more about Storybook. I mentioned it in my first talk, but Storybook is basically a super popular tool for developing and testing UI components in isolation. So it allows you to test an entire catalog of components that you create and interact with them in different states. Basically, you don't have to run your whole app to test components. The other really cool thing about Storybook is that there's docs built in. So if you're creating a design system at your company and you want people to use this, these docs basically outline every single prop and the type of that prop that's being passed in. So this is super useful and it also visualizes them. Let's go a little bit in depth on Storybook. So here I have a very ugly sample component where basically I'm taking in two props, text and color that are both strings. And then I'm setting the style on the div to the color. So the text color basically is being set by the prop. And I'm also saying this is the text you should render. So here's how a sample story would look. So you want to define the file as component.stories.tsx. Simple as that. So in there you have an export default. This export basically says, this is the title of the tab that you want to show when you're running Storybook. And this is the component that you want to render. I don't think you need to set a title. Uh, I think it can automatically do that for you, but I usually like to set it. And if you look at my other stories, I set the title to basically UI slash and then the component. You could define this to have even more subfolders. So you could have slash button slash something else, et cetera. So let's go back to sample. Here's kind of a janky way to do stories. You basically want to export const primary, whatever it is. And it's basically a function that returns the component. So here I have a primary and a secondary. For primary, the text is primary, the color is blue. For secondary, the text is secondary, the color is green. So if you look at storybook, here we have sample and here we have primary and secondary, and they both render what you think they would render. But let's do this in a little cleaner way. Instead of doing this, you can actually create a template instead. So here's what a template looks like. 
So a template basically takes in arguments and then renders that sample component and it just passes in those arguments as props. And if you look at the type of args, it is sample props. And that's because of this typing on template. Sweet. So now instead of this, what we can do is we're going to export const primary and we're going to template.bind. So bind is a standard JavaScript technique. It basically makes a copy of this template function. If you remember earlier, our other primary was also just a function. So here we're basically creating a copy of that template function that we define up here. And now you can basically set primary.args. So here you want to set text to primary and the color to blue. Awesome. Now the cool part about using args versus the previous way that when we hard coded in these props is that if you look at the at storybook now, down here, you can actually just change the text. So you can come in here and add whatever you want. You can also set the color immediately here as well. Let's say you want to see what it looks like green or red. You can change that right here. And so similarly to how we do primary, we also want to do secondary. So I'm just going to copy over secondary and place it here and here. Cool. And now we have a secondary option as well. It does seem like more code in a way, but the really cool thing is if you define primary args, for example, on let's say the primary button, sometimes a lot of those arguments aren't gonna change for other components. So let's say you want a button to have the same text, like sample, for example, right? So let's change this to sample. And you also want secondary's text to be sample. Instead of doing this, all you'd have to do is spread primary.args. And what this does is it will take all of the args that you defined up here and pass it into this arguments. And it'll overwrite color to, let's say, green <laughs> instead of blue. And it'll overwrite the color to green. So if you look back at our storybook, we have primary and then we have secondary. And it just says sample. That's pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed this part two of my design system video. We go a little bit more in depth on certain topics that I didn't get to talk about in my last video. If you do want to watch that last video, I'll link it down below. It's on the Next.js channel, so it's not here. <laughs> and if you like more content like this, be sure to like and subscribe. And let me know if you want me to go more in depth on anything else in the comments below. All right, have a good one, everyone. Bye.